right. Welcome back for our third and final session of our uh, marriage and relationship workshop, Five Thoughts on Marriage and Relationship. It's nice to uh, to see everybody again, and I want to welcome our speaker. Uh, we have Mr. Uh, Doctor, I should, I, I believe. Mr. Jim. Mr. Oh, Mr. Okay, Mr. <laughs> Jim Schleicher. Uh, he is a licensed marital and family therapist um, and has over 40 years of experience. And he is also one of our very own. He's a Woodmont Christian Church member. And so uh, without further ado, I'll, I'll let him expand if he'd like to on his credentials and uh, want to welcome you into the meeting and welcome you, uh, Jim Schleicher. Thank you. Biggest credential is my wife, Livy, and I, this is our second marriage. We each brought three kids with us, five of whom have gotten married and have been married. And my biggest credential is we got uh, 14 grandchildren. So quite proud of that and glad for that. Uh, thank you for having me tonight. Uh, it's been a good series with uh, Janet and with Adam. So I appreciate everybody's participation in that. Let me begin this with a word of prayer. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O God, for you are our rock and our redeemer. And if you are a Woodmont person, you know and recognize that prayer because it is the prayer that Clay uses every Sunday as he begins his sermon. And as I heard him this past Sunday, I thought, gosh, the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts, what if we applied that to our families? What if we made it our business to make sure everything we said in the spirit of our hearts were pleasing to God? Would that not of itself change most anything and everything we needed to change? In a Christian marriage, we think oftentimes of the vows as being a covenant between the two people getting married, but actually in the tradition of Christianity, what the wedding vows really mean is we are covenanting with God to tend to the spirit and soul of the other person. And so there's something about covenanting with one another, promising each other, but the stakes are highly, highly elevated and, es and uh, escalated when we think of our covenant is truly with God to tend to one another in the, in the marriage process. I do, before I go on any further, just wanna mention, I am really proud to be a member of this church. There are this evening four different uh, uh, opportunities for Wednesday kind of study. Uh, this church is really not afraid to take on hard stuff. Uh, this church is also wanting to be the voice of civility and patience in a world where polarization is ruling. And so even tonight, we've got Bible study, we've got divorce care, we've got politics with a Vanderbilt professor and pollster. And then we've got this relationship series that we're concluding tonight. If you paid attention to the emphasis that Woodmont puts on relationship study, if we go back to the summer where Clay and Hunter talked about the Enneagram and the impact of our Enneagram number and how that manifests in relationship. And then last two weeks ago, if you heard Janet, she added the Myers-Briggs personality indicator into the mix. And then she added the four horsemen of destruction, kind of a Gottman thing, but talk about uh, criticism, contempt, stonewalling and defensiveness as being that which brings a marriage down. The big one being contempt. And that when contempt enters into a marital relationship, there's a 90 plus percentage uh, op op possibility that this is gonna end up in divorce. I would add the other one that's big for me in addition to contempt is criticism. And I would just want to mention that I have never seen criticism in a marriage, in a part, committed partnership. I have never seen that work well or have any positive motivational impact on a relationship. And then she also talked about the five love languages. And then Adam last week enhanced a lot of what Janet had said and then added some things about romance and then added some things about what we bring with us into a relationship that are going to be the triggers that inform how we operate with one another within a relationship. So <clears throat> I think studying relationships and particularly relationships and family is such a critical thing for us to be spending our time and attention looking at and spending time prayerfully trying to get better at. Because we live in a time where ugliness is seen as a strength and kindness is seen as a weakness. 
And if we ever needed a time to turn that around, I can't think of a better one than now. So I'm not going to be particularly politically correct. I'm going to talk about committed partnerships. I'm going to talk about marriage. What I'm not going to talk a whole lot about, because I don't have very much professional experience, is gay and straight relationships. And so I'm just going to say that I've got a lot of personal experience. My daughter and her wife have a beautiful little one-year-old. But professionally, I don't have a lot of experience. So this is going to be primarily geared towards straight relationships. And I'll let you kind of do the interpolations as needed to be happen. I want to talk about the centrality of marriage. Um, we all know that if we're in a committed partnership in a marriage, that the centrality of this relationship affects everything else we do. And we all know that we are, in, when we're in a good place and feel a lot of connectivity with the other person, not just does this relationship go better, but everything we do goes better. It has that kind of centrality. We also know that when we get out of sync with the other, or where there's a bit of contention or where there's arguing, whatever it is, everything else we do in life is just slightly more difficult, just has a bit of a rougher edge on it. And yet the irony for me, given what I do for a living, is this kind of centrality of marriage happens at the same time we would run absolutely no other arena of life as sloppily as we do marriage. In any other arena of life, we always take stock about what's working, what has become obsolete. We take stock about what we need to add. But in relationship of this proportionate importance, we put the darn thing on cruise control and then wonder why it sometimes slips and goes astray. So it's got that kind of centrality and we bring the least amount of intentionality to it. And I wanna talk about another component to this if you got kids or contemplating kids. Working on this connectivity in this relationship is the best parenting you will ever do. I don't care what kind of parenting books you read, what kind of parenting seminars or speakers you hear, the connectivity you have in the primary adult relationship is far more important. It is a rule in all of family work that when this is working really well between the two adults, it's just a given kids will get what they need. And any time, when so much feels out of our control. I was telling Lauren before we started, I think every, se every session I've had so far this week, politics and pandemic have come in. But it becomes crucial we differentiate things that we can control from things that are well without our control. And one of the things we are in charge of is how we choose to be with each other. So my five thoughts tonight are actually going to be numbers. The numbers are 93, 70, 60, 4, and 3. And so let me go on with this. So probably in four out of five times that a couple comes in my office, when I ask the opening question is, what brings you here? And again, probably four out of five times roughly they're in, is the response is, we're not communicating. And in the back of my mind, there's a slight chuckle that begins to form. I just want to say you're communicating all the time because this number 93, 93% of all communication, particularly in family, is at the nonverbal level. It is what we exude. It's what we transmit. It's the undercurrent. It's the, it's what we, what we really are saying and not the words, but what is our presence in the presence of our spouse? And a good bit of the time, not always, but a good bit of the time when the couple comes in, what they're really saying, and we're not communicating, it's kind of code for, we still love each other, but we fell out of like a while back, and we'd like to try to get that back. And so if there is a big takeaway in this 93, the big takeaway is what is my presence in the presence of my spouse? Is it kind? Is it gentle? Is it soft? Is it warm? And most of all, is it friendly? Or conversely, has it become harsh? And has it become abrupt? And has it become a bit abrasive? And has it become a bit unkind? And has is, is it lost its friendship in it? And it is such an important concept for us right now in terms of what is the presence of ourselves in the presence of those we love being in family. In the last two months as this pandemic has gone on, 
we've seen a drastic rise in irritability in families, and it's understandable. But we can't give ourselves permission to give up the good stuff. At a time when we most need to be nice to each other, we can't give in to being harsh and anything other than being nice. So here's what happened. What happens when you lose the niceness? And where do you lose the license? Well, statistically, I'm going to give us three stages of a relationship, and then I think they kind of recycle around. The three stages are infatuation, followed by disappointment. And if you're in a committed relation, disappointment happens roughly between the second and fourth year. And I want to just underline the disappointment phase. No relationship gets a buy. You don't get a pass. You don't get a detour. After infatuation comes disappointment. And that's when people hit the disappointment phase, they feel like there's something maybe wrong with the essential fabric of the relationship. It's why 75% of all divorces happen in the first four years. But disappointment just happens. And it just happens in two ways, both of which can be difficult on us. One is we begin to experience some sense of disappointment in our spouse. And maybe equally harsh, we begin to, we begin to experience ourselves as somewhat of a disappointment to our spouse. And after all, when we get in a committed relationship, we don't leave our sinfulness at the door. We are flawed. We are inadequate. We are sinners. And that comes with us. Unfortunately, where it shows often most clearly is in the most important relationships we have. And in the most important relationships we have where we should be the most kind and precious, oftentimes that's where the harshness and the unkindness shows more directly. And then we make it, make it even more complicated. It's only in family that if something's not working, we do more of it. It's only in family that if something's not working, we increase the decibels and up the intensity. In every other arena of life, if something's not going well, we try to make a shift. But in family, we just up it. We just increase it. And so that's where the disappointment gets stuck. The reason the disappointment this stage is so important, if you don't work through disappointment, you don't get to cooperation. And what happens in that second to fourth year in a lot of situations is that's when you begin to have children or that's been career, sh career shifts begin to happen. And it's at that time where disappointment sets up habits. And we think of habits as primarily being, being behavioral, but habits are just as strong cognitively and emotionally. It's where we begin to make a habit and a routine of how we view our spouse, how we begin to see each other. And I see couples that have been married 20, 25 years, they got into the disappointment phase and they never got out and they never figured out what it meant to get to cooperation. So when you get into the disappointment phase, what happens next is you move from the proactivity of a relationship to the reactivity of a relationship. And from my chair, you can always see when a relationship has gone reactive is that it use, loses its ability to differentiate little stuff from big stuff. That something this minute can get the same attention as something potentially life-threatening. And what happens in reactivity is nothing is too small to get our attention. And the rule of thumb in family work is dynamic always trumps content. And what that means is what, once a dynamic sets up, it doesn't matter what you put in the subject line. So if the dynamic of reactivity replaces proactivity, this is getting kind of hard and abstract, but when reactivity becomes dominant in a relationship, then you lose your ability to differentiate little stuff from big stuff. For instance, my wife, Livy and I, we've come to full agreement that toilet paper ought to come off the top of the roll. We've made a lot of progress in terms of how the dishwasher should be loaded. And we still got a fair amount of work to do in terms of how the cups and the glasses ought to be placed in the cupboard. And that's the little stuff, but it has to be worked out, has to be worked through. And once reactivity takes place, then it defines everything. And then what follows reactivity that gets in our way relationally even more is one of us slips into the role of critical parent and the other into chastised child. And in most relationships, we take turns, but critical parent, chastised child is what follows when reactivity comes to us. And reactivity is almost a given 
There's a continuum of how severe it happens, but it does happen. And in the critical parent child, the critical parent role, you feel like at some point I can't mention anything without him or her getting defensive. So I can't raise anything without them taking it as a criticism. So I kind of give up bringing things up because it doesn't go anywhere. And in the chastised child role, you feel like I only got two choices, comply or defy, neither of which feels like a very adult thing to do. But in both of those, you lose the equality of the relationship. It gets skewed. Now, in a lot of relationships, it's pretty fluid and it shifts back and forth. But once reactivity sets in motion, then nothing happens till you fix the reactivity. So how do you fix it? Well, two things. One, and you're going to hear this theme so repeatedly, is you bring intentionality back to the relationship. You pull it off cruise control. You don't let your marriage just run as sloppily as oftentimes you let it do because we're not bringing the same intentionality we do to every other arena of our life. And so what you do is you create a vision of yourself as being the best partner you can imagine yourself to be at this point in your life. And then you begin to hold yourself to that bar. You quit looking across the relationship to see what the other is doing. And you get an image of yourself as being a really good partner in this relationship. And you set a really high bar for how close that you can come to that vision of yourself as a spouse. And then with intentionality, then I will oftentimes say to bring intentionality to a relationship, let's have a weekly marital meeting. And we can cover a lot of topics, but one of the topics we're going to cover is on a scale of one to 10, how would I rate me as a spouse? And on a scale of one to 10, how would I rate us as a coupleship? If a couple is sitting across from me, I talk about there being three entities. There's this person, and there's this person, and then there's this third entity called your relationship. And like any relationship, I talk about that being like an account. And you got to put a ton of deposits in that relationship account. That's our we and us account. That's what happens when we move from two me's and become a strong sense of we and us. And you put tons of deposits in that account because that account by life's journey takes a ton of withdrawals. And like any account, when you've got a lot of deposits and you get a withdrawal, there's a surplus. There's something that kind of cushions when we get out of sync, when we get contentious. But when that account gets dangerously low or depleted, when things happen between us that get us out of sync, it hits raw nerve because our surplus and reserve has completely been used up. So one of the things we talk about is getting that account built up before we take on other issues to lower the reactivity. And as I said, reactivity dominates the relationship when you hit in the disappointment phase. And if you use that as there's there's two places, I'll get to that one in a few minutes. But when that happens, then reactivity becomes the dominant way of interacting with each other and things go awry and really don't get better. Second number, 70. What that refers to is the percentage of issues in a marriage that are not likely to resolve. If you've got two people, both of whom are fully adult and um, got their own thoughts and feelings and beliefs and opinions themselves, you're going to get out of sync. You're going to get out of sync. Most of the work in marriage these days is not even trying to avoid out of syncness. Most of the work in relationships is what do you do when you get out of sync? Is that most of my energy is not to avoid disruption with couples, but to keep them from going so deep in the ditch and getting out of the ditch as quickly as possible. So this gets at where the there's 70, that number I can use twice. 70 is the number of issues that don't resolve in a relationship. 70 is also the percentage of marriages that take a pretty good hit after the birth of a child. Six months after the birth of a child, people do begin to feel that sense of are we and us and we're just in it for ourselves and we have lost our sense of being joined with one another and in this journey with each other, except around our common love and adoration of this child. We can garner ourselves and become a we with the child, our family, but the sense of we and us just as a coupleship gets lost and our expectations from each other 
they just keep going increasingly on net. And when that happens, what gets out of sync is everything from finances, the little stuff, how to parent, how to negotiate anything. And that you know you are stuck in reactivity because no matter what you talk about, big or small, you get out of sync and you can't seem to get out of it. Janet talked two weeks ago about uh, Gottman's work in terms of in a healthy relationship, uh, you have five to eight positive exchanges for every negative. And that ratio needs to be operational in any relationship that if you want to problem solve effectively. But it is particularly important when it comes to the issues in a relationship we can't resolve. When that ratio is operational for us, then we don't worry as much about things we can't resolve. If you've spent any time with somebody, then you know there are certain issues. You can beat the daylights out of that, and it's just simply not going to resolve. But what a couple gets really good at is differentiating things we can resolve from things we simply have to manage as a dilemma. And we stay focused on the things that we can manage as a dilemma and not spend as much time trying to work on things where we end up with the same impasse. In most marital issues that are difficult, you run across the same issue, and it's usually the dynamic of reactivity that has resulted in a chastised child and a critical parent dynamic. So that gets us to the only predictor we have of satisfaction in a relationship. The only thing that stands up in all of the research that defines whether or not this relationship is going to be successful. We know that the biggest predictor that it won't be successful is contempt and somewhat criticism. But the biggest, biggest predictor we have is friendship. And this is the point in this presentation where I feel like I'm calling third graders off the playground and simply saying, be nice. And that operation of that operational need to be friendly with each other and operate with each other as truly good friends. If you have spent any significant time with your partner over time, particularly if you get eight, 10 years in a relationship, then you want to make sure that when you say who's your best friend, it's not some other guy or some other woman, that your best friend becomes your partner. And the person you have the most fun with becomes your partner. <clears throat> and a lot of that friendship and a lot of that partnership, we circle back to the first number, which is 93, has to do with what is our presence in the presence of each other. Is it, is it defined by kindness and friendship, or have we lost that with one another? Third number, 60. 60 is the percent that we use for what we call devitalized relationship. Most of the attention on long-term relationships and marriage are focused on the divorce rate, which has hung around 50% for probably the last 15 years, maybe a little bit more. But an equally important statistic is 60% of marriages that maintain are what we call devitalized. Yes, they're staying together but they're not necessarily staying together for all the good reasons. Staying together for the kids is valid. Staying together for lots of reasons has some validity, but it's not enough. It's a relationship that has lost its vibrancy. And when it lost its vibrancy, it affects the momentum in a relationship. People that study communication talk a lot about momentum. And what they talk a lot about is the fact that relationships seldom are on a plateau. If you think we're about the same as we've been, it means you're silently and quietly losing ground. Relationships are either getting better or they're losing steam. They are very seldom for any length of time on a plateau. And we're losing steam. It can be typically quite slow and very insidious, but typically things may seem a bit worse than they actually might be. But if you're in a relationship that has lost its energy, it is exhaustive. It is just hard. Life is hard enough. I talk about parenting. I talk about family. Is Our choice is never whether it's hard or easy. Our choice is only between is it going to be good hard or bad hard. And particularly in this time of political upheaval and this time of pandemic, life is really difficult. But in the midst of that, we can't give ourselves a buy to play victim to that in terms of how we behave in the presence of our families. So in the midst of momentum, you're either going downward or you're going upward. 
And when things are getting better, there is an energy that is created by that. I go back to when a couple is really well connected, there's an energy source that comes from that. And things may not even as, be as good as we think they are, but who cares? We're enjoying it. And so the energy that comes from connectivity and from a healthy relationship then translates into all the other arenas, arenas of our life, as I mentioned earlier. Marriage has that centrality. It affects everything. So I think at this point, I'll talk a little bit, uh, Adam talked a little bit about romance. I'm going to go ahead and talk a little bit about sex, just to kind of keep your attention this time of night. Um, when reactivity sets into a relationship, then the sexual relationship tends to deteriorate. A lot of people on the street talk about the two things that are hardest in marriage are sex and money. But sex and money are only manifestations of the dynamic of reactivity that has resulted in critical parent chastised child and our loss of equality and connectivity as two adults who are sharing life. And I'm very hesitant at times to talk about gender differences because it's kind of a dicey subject. And I've been all over the place in my uh, career with how much to pay attention to that. I've been that there are a lot of gender differences. And then uh, I've gone the other direction of saying, yeah, but we're far more alike than we are different. And then I've been in the middle all over the place. But one of the places that clearly we are different is around sexual arousal. And the cliche in my field is sex for men is a microwave. For women, it's a crockpot. That the arousal for men is fairly quick. It's fairly immediate. Most men, particularly in the younger days, are, here we go, I'm ready. And for most women, absent friendship, I'm not interested. Women enjoy the foreplay that begins in affection and friendship and being connected with each other. For a woman, sex at night, the foreplay starts about noon. For men, it's typically pretty quick. For women, obviously, it's different. But that's biologically driven. Like I said, sex for men, a crock, um, microwave for women, it's a crock pot. And so what happens is disappointment gets played out in the bedroom as well. 60% of the times that sex ceases to become active in a relationship, it's the men who stop initiating and stop responding. And interestingly, conversely in the number 60, 60% of divorces are initiated by women because they're tired of the contemptuousness they feel in a relationship. And by the way, if women are in a contemptuous and a toxic relationship, we are learning more and more about the effect of what our relationships are like and how it affects our health. And women who chronically live in a toxic relationship, statistically, it shortens their lives by six to eight years. So this is an old stat and I haven't seen it upgraded, but probably 10 years ago, maybe a little bit longer, I read many studies that said probably people that enter marriage counseling, they haven't had any kind of sexual connection for an average of five to eight years. And I think that's probably not the same now because going into counseling doesn't have the same stigma once did. But it is typical for me, and I have a practice of highly functional, competent people. It is not unusual for that part of the relationship to have waned significantly. And it is affected by a lot of factors, by age, it's affected by chronic illness, it's affected by stress and everything else. So there are a lot of things in children and all those kind of things. All I wanna suggest around the area of intentionality, it's important to address. And when affection has taken a serious hit, it probably is the manifestation of something else that's worth talking about. So four. The number four. And what I want to talk here about the four levels of relational distress. And the reason I want to talk about that a little bit is, well, it becomes self-explanatory. When we get angry and we get frustrated, it's certainly a valid emotion. And usually there's a kernel of truth in that which upsets us and frustrates us and makes us angry. But anger and frustration in a relationship is a relatively upper level step. And if you go to one step or tier, T-I-E-R below that, it means we've been hurt and wounded. And if you go to a step of pain below hurt and wounded, it means we feel devalued and disrespected. 
And then if you go to the deepest pain in a relationship is when you end up feeling invisible and anonymous. It's at this lowest level of anonymity and invisibility. It's why, and this is not okay by any stretch, but it's why kids of neglect have a worse prognosis than kids who are abused. The most difficult pain we experience is not being known and not experience curiosity. And I mentioned this primarily because if we are angry and frustrated or experiencing hurt and being wounded, it's the manifestation of feeling violated at those lower two levels of devaluation, disrespect, invisibility, and anonymity. So if couples are frustrated and angry and walking around hurt, then just assume it means there is something deeper going on at this level of respect and at this level of being curious to be known and being seen. And then finally, <clears throat> the number three. Number one, date nights are great. Weekend getaways are great. Trips are great. But all the data suggests that marriages at the end of the day are made and broken in most ordinary time. Having done this work for nearly 50 years, I've gotten quite simple, is I am so impressed in a relationship how far it goes when the relationship is defined by kindness, by respect, and by appreciation. And I know those are kindergarten concepts, but they are so important. And so we ask ourselves in ordinary time, are my, what is my presence? I keep coming back to that 93%. Have I done something nice for the other? Have I expressed appreciation for the other? John Gottman, who's one of the biggest guns in the field and probably the best researcher in the field, his mantra is small things often. And he talks about the value of the little stuff in the most ordinary time. For instance, we got the four minute rule, is if a couple is apart during the day and they come together at the end of the day, if you video and pay attention to the first four minutes that they are with each other, you can define pretty much how successful this relationship is gonna be experienced by them. That four minutes when a couple comes together at the end of the day, those are the most important four minutes in the relationship. And what that is about is at the end of the day, not necessarily checking in with each other about how was your day, because particularly men don't want to go through one more time the litany of what they did. But in that four minutes, there's a genuine curiosity about how were you in this day? What was it like to be you in this day or some variation thereof? If you got kids and you're coming together and it's a busy time, we call it arsenic hour in families for a good reason. But at that time, it's also very, once that the highs have been said in the hugs and kisses, is for the kids to learn they're not the center of the universe, that this adult relationship is the most important relationship in our family. So for the kids to somehow over time, age appropriate, be taught, you're going to have to wait a few minutes because the adults are going to have to find a little connectional time. And I am convinced that adults that take this time to have that connection it not only defines the evening going differently, but I think it makes a huge difference in how well people sleep. So number one is marriage is made and broken in ordinary time. Number two, and I'm going out on a limb here, but having done this as long as I have, I get the right to do so, is I'm going to make a generalization about what men want, and I'm going to make a generalization about what women want. And most of the time in relatively healthy relationships that are struggling, what men are most of all asking for, this is really, we're pretty simple guys, is I just need to know you like me. Is if a guy experiences that his partner genuinely likes him, that scratches a pretty deep itch. And my other big generalization, which is an overgeneralization in both categories, but the other generalization for women is, I just need to know that you're genuinely curious and interested in how I think and feel. Men need to know that they're liked. Women need to know that their spouse and partner is genuinely interested in what they're about and how they think and feel. And my third comment on the number three is, I've noticed in the last months, and I guess it's 
just the accumulation of everything that's gone on in the last eight months. But people don't smile anymore. I'm asking all of us to just the simple act. There, in our, our face has more muscles than any other part of our body. There are 35 different ways to smile that we have. But I'm seeing a huge decrease in the ability of people just giving each other a smile. So my three things are pretty simple. Number one, kindness, respect, and appreciation. Number two, understanding what each other might need, maybe in its most simplistic form. And three, just having the capacity to share a smile with one another. And then finally, and then we'll have time for questions if there are any, and if not, we'll just go home. Well, we are home. Um, anyway, finally, I just wanna say that in this year, from the youngest of kids to the oldest of us, we're all gonna remember 2020. And I'm challenging all of us in the last two months of this year is can we be really intentional about how we want to remember this year? And yes, we can say it was really hard and it got really frustrating and it was very difficult at times. And this whole deal about getting an education with kids not being able to be at school and in and out of school and COVID, it's all really, really hard. But are we gonna say it took its toll and it beat us up? Or are we gonna say in the realm of our families, in the realm of our relationships, we were good. We maintained a sense of appreciation and kindness. And most of all, we did this as really good friends. And I'm challenging all of us in these last two months to make sure we're intentional in trying to define how that goes. And that's what I got. So if we got questions or comments, then let's throw them in. I don't know that I can see the chat. Lauren, are you any round or anybody able to respond to this? I don't see any questions currently in the chat, but I would encourage um, those on the call to, to jump in and, and throw in questions. And, and James, you can see them in the, in the chat section, I believe. So um, I tell everybody in the group, fire away if you've got them. Well, some nice comments, so I'll take that. <laughs> My need for affirmation is pretty pretty huge, you know, so we, anybody else who wants to throw it in there, please do so. Jim, can you talk more about um, uh, the, the chastised child or the, I forget the, the word there. Um, chastised I mean, child? Well, or the um, controlling parent. Or, uh, it's critical parent, chastised critical child. Parent, yeah. Um, I mean, how do you differentiate like being critical versus needing to talk about, you know, an issue at hand and trying to really deal with the matter in a, in a positive kind of fashion? Well, what we talk about is the difference between criticism and complaints. Complaints are about a behavior. Criticism takes a shot at character. So if you talk about what's happening, this is a behavior that's upsetting. But you avoid labels. You're lazy. You always... One of the ways that, that you can always in my chair understand when a couple's reactivity has gone off the charts is they start using absolute language, always, never, everything, nothing. Once you know that a couple is even thinking in absolute language, you know, we all get together for the opposites attract is really true. And those complementations in each other is what draws us together. But when when um, those kind of uh, absolute language things come in or critical parent chastised child, those natural compl complementations that can be useful, they are experienced as polarizations. We are not alike. We don't have much in common anymore. We don't share much. We've lost our ability to have shared experiences that we mutually enjoy. So it doesn't mean we can't talk about difficult subjects but we talk about them as behaviors that are troublesome for me and difficult for me. It's not about who you are. Because what happens when you talk about criticisms, each time you have a failed conversation that you brought up, it's probably not a big deal. It's a very, very thin film layer of resentment. But you start stacking those up together, those thin film layers become a block of resentment. And then you start looking at each other through the filter of of resentment. It's like when that happens over time, it's as if somebody's put on a pair of glasses 
that have a certain tint to those lenses. And it doesn't matter what we do, if we are seen by the other through those glasses, then that's the way we're going to be, we're going to be understood. And it goes back to those patterns where I want to say cognitive and emotive beliefs or habits are just as strong as our behavioral habits. And if we see over time somebody a particular way, they don't have a chance. And then if you're on the other end of it, you feel like, man, that you, who you're seeing is not me, not who I know myself to be. I may not be all that self-aware, but that's really off base. There's probably a kernel of truth in it, but we can't talk about it because it's seen as a generalization of character as opposed to just being a criticism of a behavior that we'd like to have addressed. Does that answer it, John? Yeah, no, that's, I, I, like, I just was looking for some elaboration on it. And it sounds like you're saying if you're trying to have those conversations, but you know, they don't resolve, that's that thin layer that starts adding up and that's what to pay attention to? Well, it pays attention to when, when, the, um, when the behavior, every time a resentment gets unresolved, it's another thin, thin film layer. When that starts to build, it adds to the reactivity that then eventually begins to dominate our, rea- our responses to each other. We stop responding and just react. And that's where you end up, every conversation tends to end up at least with the same emotional impasse. I want to normalize this disappointment goes with the turf because we bring our sinfulness with us. It doesn't stay at the door. It shows up more in the nakedness of our relationship than anywhere else. So we're going to have disappointment. That's not the point. The point is how do we address that in a way that is kind and friendly and is constructive that helps us grow? If you've been married, say, 10, 15 years, you ought to be on the third or fourth marriage within the marriage. And what I see so much is couples working on a set of patterns that got established fairly early. They developed as individuals, they developed as professionals, they developed as different social skills, what they need. And they're operating in a relationship that has become obsolete to who they've now become. And how that usually looks to somebody like me, as I'll so often say to couples, you know, this marriage isn't anywhere near as good as the people in it because it's become obsolete. It no longer functions and feeds the way it once did. I see a good marriage as two people connected by a rubber band. And that rubber band, one of the cliches in marital work is separateness is the prerequisite for closeness. You want to have a full sense of autonomy and individuality that's independent of the relationship. And so that rubber band goes out and you have your own hobbies and your own successes and your own beliefs and interests, et cetera, et cetera, friends and all that kind of stuff. And then there's this draw back in toward my bestest friend, for where I find the safest, most comfortable place to be. And it's that rubber band, the movement of that, dynamic of that, that keeps it vibrant and alive and keeps it growing. If it stretches too far and I get all my needs met outside of the relationship in a primary way, it's going to snap. But if it comes in and it goes limp, then it's going to get boring. For instance, in uh, back to the sex feet, the, the three key words in sex therapy, are nice, naughty, and novel. It's always respectful. You want to add some spice to it. And anything that you do is becomes too familiar, loses its spunk. So even in the midst of that, you want that vibrancy to take place, but it's that vibrancy that goes back and forth in that rubber band that keeps us alive and keeps us growing. Does that make sense? Other questions? Other comments? Well, Clay's not here, so I can keep him coming. Well, I don't also don't want to belabor this. If, if uh, we've gotten what we got, I've kind of said the basics, but I'm happy to respond to what other people might want to ask or even comments and any pieces of that that really don't make sense or you think differently about would appreciate that feedback as well. Here's, here's one serious question, though. Um, what would you say is a healthy sex life in a marriage? Depends on how much you pay me. Um, that's got that's got uh, so many variables. As I said, age, illness, stress. There's so many things that go in there. Most importantly, is we continue to be able to talk about it as friends, and we appreciate our differences. Um, there is no there is no um, sort of guideline that says if you've been married five years, it ought to be once or twice. What's interesting is oftentimes in relationships where people are um, they're in the office because they're really struggling. 
they still have a pretty healthy dynamic sex life. Is I mean, let me expand this a little bit. Closeness in a relationship is defined by the amount of energy that transacts between people, not the quality of that energy. So if people are at war, then that's a really close relationship because you're not thinking about anything else. You're not, not pondering anything else. You're fully engaged with each other. If a couple comes in my office and they're pretty contentious with each other, I got all that energy in the room to work with. The marriages that are most difficult is when apathy has come in. They've quit trying. They say, we don't fight much at all anymore, but there's no vibrancy to it. There's no real energy in it anymore. That becomes the hardest to treat of all, is when you lose that ability to engage in a way that's passionate. Um, and that translates eventually into the sexuality part of it. It's just expand that is um, most of the time absent a woman feeling a keen sense of the friendship, she's not going to be a whole lot interested. Men, because our arousal cycle is so short, won't necessarily require that. But that's a genuine biologic difference. That's not a character trait. Anything else? Well, I don't know if Lauren's been able to come back. She's been on mommy duty here while we've been working on this. I am here, Jim. I, I came right before John's um, last question, which was a doozy. Oh. I guess it was a good one to come in on. <laughs> yeah, that, well, that's we, we, somebody needed to ask it. <laughs> the important part is the intentionality of that. Even if somebody says, I'm not particularly there right now, but is able to say, I know you are, and that's valid, and I want to get there too. The intentionality of being able to talk about that with each other and it being an important part of our connectivity with one another, that's what we're looking for. Well, Jim, based on the Q&A and, and some of the comments, it seems like this was super engaging and people really enjoyed it. And um, if there are any other questions, please put them in the chat now and, and we'll address them. And if not, then um, I suppose we'll start wrapping up. And I just want to let everybody know, I don't know exactly when these sessions will be posted to our YouTube channel, but I'll get with our communications director, Matt, about that um, this evening. I'll send him an email. So as soon as they're posted, I'll send an email and let everybody know where they can find them. Well, any other questions? John, keep asking away if you're taking the lead on this. Any question you ask, somebody else is thinking. No, I mean, you did go into one I was going to ask you, like, what, what, um, what gets you excited that you're dealing with a healthy couple, like when you're meeting and talking with them? And you, you kind of started, you know, commenting that a little bit a second ago, but yeah, I'm just curious, like, you know, when you're meeting with a couple, what, what in the back of the mind starts triggering you with like, Hey, this is a good relationship. You know, what are those indicators? You, I mean, friendship you've mentioned, but. Well, when a couple's in a healthy place, you can feel the lightness in the room between them. I mean, at that nonverbal level, you experience that just like you experience the tension. Uh, so you feel the lightness. What you're most of all looking for is not the absence of problems, but when a couple is getting healthy, it's when they're saying, we got out of sync, but we didn't go deep in a ditch and we got out fairly fast. All the work in marriage right now is not about avoiding disruption. It's about repair. Is We didn't go so deep into it and we got out of it quickly and we got to a good place. One of my favorite strategies, this is mine a couple, when they'd get out of sync and they couldn't seem to fix the conversation, they'd get two chairs and they'd sit across from each other naked. And they had to stay in the chair till they got to a better place with each other. And it was interesting how they almost couldn't help themselves from getting better. So if you want to use that one, that's a good one. <laughs> Anything else? 
John's getting a free session out of this. <laughs> yeah, I just messaged Jim. I'm worried he's going to send me a bill when this is over. <laughs> Hey, Jim, uh, I noticed down in the chat, um, Holly just asked, what is the third phase of the three phases of a relationship? Cooperation. You go from infatuation to disappointment to cooperation. And cooperation is, is a really nice place to be, but you don't cycle that just once. And the whole notion of stages of marriage, a lot of people have five, I've seen as many as 14. I think those three simply recycle over and over again where that sense of when we cooperate and all of a sudden I fall, we fall in love all over again. And then we hit another disappointment phase. We have to work through that to get to cooperation. And the two places that disappointment hits is usually two to four years into it is maybe the first one. That's statistical. It doesn't necessarily be uh, an absolute by any stretch. And the second place disappointment is roughly six months after the birth of the child. And oftentimes you can see after the birth of a child, they get in a disappointment phase and they try to fix it by having another kid, which obviously doesn't go anywhere. So that's where they get stuck. And then 20 years later, they're in my office or somebody's office where essentially they just got arrested back there and they didn't find a way to get the relationship to grow out of it. Any other questions I'm missing? I didn't catch that one. Um, how long after you, you said six months after the birth of a child is when the disappointment phase kind of sets in? Is there like, I mean, a timeline for when that resolves, like once the child's a couple years old, or I mean, like you said, you have another child usually by that point. Um, I'm flooding them. <laughs> yeah. I think we're pretty good, but I don't know. <laughs> well, it, it resolves when a couple makes sure they're paying attention to the coupleship that I talk a lot about going from two me's to a we and an us. And where it doesn't resolve is the we becomes us and the kid. And they don't work on the nature of this coupleship has to have an entity of an us that just belongs to the coupleship. And when it resolves is when we again sense have a sense of us. The, the rule of thumb in family work is we want a strong sense of we and us in the adults. And then over time, it's a kid's job to integrate into that. And in the child-centeredness that our culture has become, instead of kids having to grow into the we and us of the adult world, the adults are putting all the attention down and making sure we're paying attention to the, So we join the kid's world instead of over time inviting the kid to join the adult world. And that's why we get this sort of child-centeredness. Mm -hmm. This whole parenting thing has got a whole, effort, a whole new theme to it. So a lot into that one. Well, it shifted from a helicopter parent to a lawnmower parent. Well, we went from helicopter and then we went to the Velcro and now we go to snowplow. Maybe mm -hmm. lawnmower is the same kind of concept. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things, and I think one of the silver linings, if maybe in the pandemic for some kids, not all kids, because it's horrific for most kids. But one of the things that we have let our kids down in the last generation is we've not done a good job teaching kids how to be miserable successfully. So kids have not had the, re in the parenting pieces, I talk about the two things kids need to launch successfully are empathy and resilience. And when you're doing the, the um, snowplow stuff, you're not giving kids a chance to learn how to be miserable successfully. What a life lesson we have to have. And a lot of kids are getting that this time and it will serve them well. It's really tough for guys like me who work with adolescents is we've seen in the last years, kids don't have to be anywhere near as distressed to be potentially self-injurious because they don't know how to be unhappy. Mm. And parents doing everything they can to keep that from being learned. It's okay. interesting. Oh, I'm sorry. It, it's just interesting that, that um, you don't have to make a decision. You want kids to launch or not. Uh, even before the pandemic, 34% of kids ages 22 to 34 were living at home. And since July, it's now 52% of kids are not are still living at home and some for very good reasons, but not necessarily for all the reasons we would want. What's always struck me is kids who are staying at home, how the parents are okay with that. Shoot, when my kids were growing up, I was waiting for my turn. No one gonna happen until they were launched. But 
resilience and empathy are the two things that I think kids need to launch successfully. Hey, Jim, I think Mary has a question as well. I do. And it's the total other end of the spectrum. So um, our, my mom, our mom is just been, um, she's in hospice. And so there is this great affinity to be with her girls, but from Park's perspective, that's his mom. And so just trying to be respectful of that feeling. And yet I've got siblings who are going, this isn't social. You're coming up from Nashville. You're coming to Louisville. Um, how do we balance that love that he has for my parent and respect that he's my husband? And they're like, we just want to hang with you, Mayor. We just want to do stuff. And so I want to honor him and his relationship. And I'm kind of confused about all that right now because they just want me. And so, <laughs> I mean, they love you, but they want me. So I'm just kind of, it's totally the other, other I mean, I told Lauren a couple of weeks ago, we have more than doubled the age of young professionals, but it's my world right now. And I'm just asking for some guidance in that of, how do I help him feel respected and honored because it's his mama, but my siblings need me. So any insight? Well, I don't know if it gets at that directly, but I got some thoughts. Number one is I think one of the most honored roles that we have is trying to participate in giving our parents a good death. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we only get a chance to do that once with each of them. And so a most high priority for me is as our parents are, and most of us get a turn at the hard part of the parents aging as well. And whether it be the isolation or it be the situation, health issues, et cetera. But I really prioritize a person's wanting and really wishing to participate in making sure that my mom and dad have the best that I can give them. And so that's a really high priority. And then the other boundaries have to be set in place, not to be ignored and not to be, but, but you don't want to do anything that takes away from that. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I think there's probably some hard but pretty direct conversations to be had with siblings in terms of how this works for us right now, that our highest priority is to participate in making sure that a good death happens. Thank you. Yeah, good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. well, and she thinks she's going to heaven. That's pretty good. That's a recent achievement. So we're all good. <laughs> there we go. There we, yeah. I had, uh, when my dad was dying, we had a wonderful hospice nurse and uh, um, she just would not even let us use the language of passing away. She'd say, all we're doing is passing on. Mm -hmm. Passing on. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Transition. It's all good. Yeah. It's all good. Yeah. Thank you. Anything else? Good. Can I say a word? Uh, this is Jim's brother. No. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, no, I didn't know so that. So let us know yesterday that uh, Jim would be doing this tonight. And um, so when he got to talking about our dad's dying, um, it was just, to me, it was just such a memory about how Jim and my, uh, I was the middle child and my sister and I all found a way together to be supportive of each other and defined our roles differently like each of us had a different way to play out that thing um and i guess i want to just say uh to you jim um you know even though i know you um maybe better than the rest of the folks uh on this one here but i'm uh, continuing to be so proud of what thank you, you. Yeah. that means it means something my older brother likes me <laughs> <laughs> that's good and John, you know, uh, thank you for that, because mom's good. I think the issue is more about siblings and how people find their place in all of this. So that's so helpful. Thank you. We got anything else? I think Nan George just posted something. Maybe that was just to me. Let me look. No, That's to everywhere. everyone. I think we need a whole other class on losing our parents and giving them a good death. Okay. I, I did. I, and I do. Yeah. 
That would it's be a whole honor, other class. Such an honor right? role. Mm -hmm. Be a good son and an honorable son or honorable daughter as we let go of our parents. That is such a huge, it's just doing that well, you don't get many other chances to do it. Mm -hmm. For sure. Good stuff. Yeah, it's good stuff. Lauren? I'm glad we had some, some further questions. That's, that was great. That was great. Um, Jim, thank you so much for spending your evening with us and your time and, and expertise and sharing that with us. And we, we so appreciate it. Um, and I think this has been hugely helpful. Well, you, it's been good to be part of this. Like I said earlier, it's really good to be part of this church. <laughs>